Over 800 judges from the district judiciary are in attendance this weekend. Judges of the Supreme Court and Chief Justices of all the high courts are participating with them to make this a first of its kind conference. The conference will facilitate a dialogue between the district judiciary and everyone else so as to understand the concerns of judges of the district judiciary and enable us to chart out collective visions for the future of the Indian legal system. The district judiciary is the first point of contact for a citizen in search of justice. The district judiciary is a crucial component of the rule of law. The arc of pending cases is defined by a triangle or a pyramid, large at the base and tapering as we move upwards. Data on the national judicial data grid reveals a basic truth. The district judiciary is not just the first, but more often the final point of contact for citizens. The reasons may be numerous. Many citizens are unable to afford legal representation. They have a lack of awareness about statutory rights. And there are geographical difficulties in physically accessing courts. The quality of our work and the conditions in which we provide justice to citizens determines whether they have confidence in us and is a test of our own accountability to society. The district judiciary is therefore called upon to shoulder tremendous responsibility and is aptly described as the backbone of the Indian judiciary. The spine is the core of the nervous system. To sustain the spine of the legal system, we must stop calling the district judiciary as the subordinate judiciary. 75 years after independence, the time has come for us to bury one more relic of the British era, the colonial mindset of subordination. Besides discharging the judicial function, judges from the district judiciary perform numerous other responsibilities. They are administrators of courts, mentors to young judges, and communicators in society. But above all, they are protectors of rights for those who possess them but may not know that they exist or are unable to enforce them. They oversee the development of infrastructure and engage in case management. They work with paralegals, legal aid committees, and lok adalats in the course of their work. District judges, like judges at the High Court and the Supreme Court, play a meaningful role in their interactions with members of the bar who are a vital stakeholder in the system. In the course of hearing a case, judges must provide valuable mentorship from the bench to younger advocates for learning the ropes of the profession. As seasoned members of the legal profession, it is easy to forget how apprehensive we all felt and how little we knew as green young advocates. Fresh out of law college, your patience, gentleness and guidance from the bench will nurture the talent of young advocates and allow them to fulfill their potential. As they grow in years, they will share the mentoring they receive for the betterment of society and the legal profession. Every judge has the ability to transform not only the lives of lawyers who appear in court, but the present and future of our society. But to do so, we must realize as judges that we exist for reasons beyond our own existence. The core of our function is to serve others. That can happen when we put ourselves in the place of those who come before us with real life stories of suffering and injustice. A young district judge from a rural court recently shared her experiences and said that while most members of the bar are respectful, a few lawyers frequently addressed her disrespectfully and with condescension. The issue appeared to arise solely due to her age and gender. Such instances can be disheartening. Your support to younger colleagues at such times is invaluable and would strengthen the fabric of the judicial institution. These multifarious responsibilities bring extraordinary challenges. It is difficult for a judge not to be affected by the actual face of suffering that each of us encounters every day. A family which is coming face to face with a gruesome crime, an under trial who is languishing for years, or the children in a parental matrimonial dispute. Judges are, despite being professionals, affected by their own brush with reality. Their mental health may suffer as a consequence. This aspect is of great consequence, but it unfortunately does not receive the attention which it merits. 
As a step towards a more open discussion on the topic, the third session today is on judicial wellness with a focus on holistic wellness, stress management, mental health and quality of life. I hope that the discussion will bring to your attention practices which not only enhance your ability to discharge your duties effectively but enrich your lives. Our education is not complete with the completion of our degrees. While our formal education may end there, our practical learning extends beyond our days at university. Each case has the potential to make us more sensitive to the human condition and the human story behind the case. This in turn enables us to practice judging with empathy and compassion. Besides, the judicial academies conduct training programs on a variety of topics, including newly enacted laws, to ensure skill upgradation. I encourage you to make use of these opportunities where highly skilled trainers are invited to share their expertise. Judges can keep up with the evolving times by updating themselves with new laws and changing societal conditions. Society changes with the passage of time. And while judges are required to be islands, standing independent, they must still be aware of the world around them. This is indispensable in ensuring that justice is delivered in each case. I must also take this opportunity to share with you data on two important aspects of the judiciary in India today. The first is to do with the adoption of technology in our legal system, and the second concerns the demographic shift in the judiciary. In 2023-24, 46.48 crore pages of court records have been scanned or digitized. 714 district court websites have been hosted on the S3 WAS platform of the Government of India. The National Judicial Data Grid, managed by the E-Committee in conjunction with the National Informatics Center, is a mine of data, not only for lawyers, but also for citizens. Two days ago, we inaugurated the War Room in the Supreme Court, which gives us a complete picture of information pertaining to every single court in India. It reflects real-time data of over four crore cases across the district courts and the high courts. 970 e-seva kendras are fully functional in district court complexes and 27 are coming up and running in the premises of the high courts. E-seva kendras assist lawyers and litigants with e-processes by providing assistance for e-filing, providing information regarding the status of the case, and so on. In so doing, these centers ensure that the digitization of the court process does not disadvantage common citizens in any way. They bridge the digital divide where it exists and reflect the principle animating citizenric services. No person will be left behind. The eCourts project has also been responsible for the computerization of over 3,500 court complexes and more than 22,000 courtrooms across India. The district judiciary has played a crucial role in deploying technology in day-to-day -day affairs. District courts in the country have heard 2.3 crore cases through video conferencing. This achievement is unparalleled in any other country in the world. The judgments of the Supreme Court are being translated in every language recognized by the Constitution. 73,000 judgments translated into all our languages are already in the public realm. This will pave the way for the dissemination of legal knowledge to citizens in the language which they understand. And I only hope that we will now have legal education in every regional language so that we generate new bands of lawyers who will be well equipped in their own mother tongues to argue before the courts and promote the cause of justice. Each of us must be alive to the fact that merely purchasing technological devices is insufficient in the mission to ensure that courts are citizen-centric. Rather, we must embrace and implement technological processes by utilizing the technology at our disposal and ensuring their full use in our work. I speak from personal experience when I say that this will not only benefit citizens and other stakeholders in the legal system, but will also ensure that our work as judges is conducted with greater efficiency. After the adoption of the Parichai application at the Supreme Court, I no longer use a pen to sign or mark the administrative files which require my attention. I instead review and approve files using my computer. This has created a smoother workflow for the registrars at the court as well. 
All my senior colleagues are also following suit. I now turn to the data on the changing demography of the Indian judiciary. An increasing number of women have been joining the district judiciary in the past few years. Women consisted of 58% of the total recruitment for civil judges in Rajasthan in 2023. 66% of the judicial officers appointed in Delhi in 2023 were women. 78 out of 108 judicial officers in Delhi were women. In Uttar Pradesh, 54% of the appointments for civil judge junior division in the batch of 2022 are women. In Kerala, 72% of the total number of judicial officers were women in the recently appointed batches. These are a few examples which paint the picture of a promising judiciary for the future. I've given you a few examples, but this example is replicated across India, whether it is Maharashtra or Madhya Pradesh. You just name the state and that is replicated. Now the question is, how do we ensure that these young women who are joining the judiciary will truly be mentors for the changing face of Indian society? And I do believe that this is the cause for hope. So we today have a young judiciary which is technologically savvy, technologically equipped, and truly representative of the changing demographic of India, of a true young nation, highly educated. They're all joining the judiciary, not as a matter of last resort, but as a matter of first resort. There has been... We must recognize that there has been a tremendous improvement in the conditions of service of our district judiciary. Now it's our time to give back to society because now that we have been recognized in terms of the conditions which have been created for us, it's time for us to remind our citizens that we exist for them and what better way to do it than in the work which we perform. These are a few examples which paint the picture of a promising judiciary of the future. The second session of the conference will address gender dynamics in the judiciary as well as the need to ensure an inclusive workplace. It is my sincere hope that this conference will elicit deep thought on how we can reshape our values and thought processes, put existing skills to use, learn new skills, and all in all, improve the manner in which the district courts function. I look forward to hearing your own thoughts and experiences and we, as we enrich each one of our members of this broad and wide judicial family across India, which is present with us for these two days. Namaskar, thank you.